We bow tonight. We, we need you so badly. We need you to breathe. We need you to digest our food. We need you to, to, to live life. And I, I pray, Father, that you would take our lives and contour of us, the kind of people that will properly define you to our culture. And I ask you to bless every request that's been mentioned tonight. I'm asking, Lord, that you would show up to be what is exactly what is needed exactly, whether it's physical, emotional, financial. And I'm asking you, Father, to reveal to us what we can do to insert ourselves in people's lives and to be a neighbor like we are supposed to be. And I ask you to bless our service tonight and give us a good week in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, in Sunday school this morning, we talked a little bit about this matter of uh, wisdom and, and what it is. Knowledge known is education. Uh, we know a lot of stuff, right? You know stuff you never use? You know, I was, I was told in school, you're going to need algebra all your life. I ain't need that algebra a day in my life since I got out of school. Now, does that mean that it's not any good? No, there's some folks that use it every day, you know, engineers and, and things like that. And so knowledge known is just, it's just education. Now, knowledge lived is wisdom. Uh, for instance, here's a guy, and he knows it's wrong to steal. So he chooses not to steal. That's wisdom. Uh, we know it's wrong to lie. But this time, you know, it's going to save me some money. So, you know, the Lord will understand. No, that's, that's lying. And the book of Proverbs teaches principles that determine uh, success or failure in the major arenas of human activity. For instance, encapsulated in the book of Proverbs is information on how to worship. Uh, it's information on business practices. It's information on personal relationships, family life, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, community life. We live in community here. Um, we've got neighbors. I've got neighbors that don't come to church here. So am I to treat them right? Well, yes, we're supposed to do that. Um, but a lot of ancient cultures had what they refer to as wisdom books. Uh, there was a, a book called The, the uh, Words of Altikar, and this, this book was known from about the 7th century. It was a 7th century B.C. Assyrian philosopher, and he just wrote down some uh, what he thought were wise proverbs. Uh, there were the instructions of Ani, and Ani was an Egyptian philosopher uh, in about the 11th century B.C., and he wrote some stuff down. Um, there were a lot of Egyptian philosophers that wrote down what they would think would be wisdom. Now, Proverbs, however, stands head and shoulders above anything that's ever been written. Now, why would you think that is? Uh, this is God's wisdom. You know, this is information from the very mind of God. This is how you live life. And it is, uh, it contains what we call a, a principle. And, and we've talked about this a number of times here through the years. And that uh, principle, it's a law or a rule based on God's character by which we govern our lives. Now, there's the law of gravity. Uh, now, what is a law? Does it, does it work the same way all the time? Yeah. You know, gravity worked yesterday. It worked 3,000 years ago. Same exact way. And um, so what does that tell you about God's way of life? It doesn't change. Exactly. It, it is consistent. It is unchanging. And um, in the book of James, look in James chapter 3, as a matter of fact. Um, James 3 Verse number 15, we get a little bit of information here. Um, well, verse 13 says, Who's a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? All right, now, who's wise? Let him show out of a good conversation, and conversation means lifestyle, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. 
For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So what are some of the signs of earthly wisdom? Uh, confusion, uh, fighting, uh, murder, all those things. But now on the other side, verse 17 says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure. And the word pure means undiluted or unmixed. It's not mixed with anything else. So it's pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. So there's, there's earthly wisdom and then there's heavenly wisdom. And um, we're told that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. The way God deals with issues, uh, we'd mentioned Eddie. Can anybody explain that? Why? I mean, it was in Avon Park, right? Thousands and thousands of cars, but it was, it was Eddie's truck, you know? Um, now, I understand he's not any different than anybody else when it comes to this matter, but I can't explain that. Uh, God's ways, and like Anna said, God's ways are not our ways. If you had been in charge of the universe, would you have prevented that? But we weren't in charge of the universe, and so it was not prevented. Um, and there are some, there's some truths. We're going to just walk through these a little bit tonight. But look in Proverbs chapter 1, and let's look at uh, some of the ways that Solomon has lined the book out. He says, well, let me get them in Psalms here. I didn't turn it out. All right, Proverbs chapter 1, he, he's going to give us sort of the, the introduction of the book is an explanation of what the book is about. And he says in verse number 2, here's one of the basic purposes, to know wisdom. The word wisdom means skill. It's the ability to do something well. And so to know wisdom and instruction. And the word instruction means discipline. How important is it to be disciplined in our behavior? Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you've got, a, you've got a football game. Have you ever seen a team get undisciplined? Was, was it, who, who were the Gators playing last year when that guy threw his shoe? That was the Gators, right? And one of the linemen got mad about something pulled his shoe off and slung it. I think he got kicked out of the game and basically it, it cost a game. He was undisciplined. That was, that was ignorant. That was foolish. And so to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding and understanding means to know right from wrong. I, I need to know right from wrong in every area of my life. Is it right or wrong to do this or to do that? To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, Equity, and equity means to be straight, to give subtlety. That's, the word subtlety is our English word appropriate. It means the right thing at the right time. And so there are, there are situations where, where laughter, for instance, is appropriate. It's perfectly fine. And then there are times when tears or more, at a funeral, for instance. You know, that, that's not a time to clown around and joke around, you know, uh, up in the pulpit. Um, and so God's wisdom gives us the ability to know right from wrong. To the simple, and the word simple means easily influenced. When, when you're young, specifically, look how easily influenced we are, you know, when we're young, without any kind of barriers or restraint. We think we can get away with anything. Anyway, to give subtlety, subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation. The word interpretation means figurative saying. And so it's like a, a symbolic thing. It, it doesn't have the literal meaning of that. Uh, and, and there are a lot of things, in, specifically in the Psalms and the Proverbs, they're symbolic, they're poetic. And you don't understand, you, you don't interpret them literally. You come up with some really weird uh, conclusions if you do. Uh, that they are symbolic. And Solomon talks about his wife. And she had, he was, he was bragging on her. He was complimenting her teeth, her smile. 
And he said that her teeth are like sheep that have come up out of the washing. You know, they've, they've been washed and they're really, they're, they're white. But was he saying that she looks like a, you know, a sheep? You got sheep's mouth? No, they were, they were even, like she'd had braces and, you know, just a beautiful smile. And uh, so he goes on to say, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, I want to just give you some things that uh, are kind of boiled down, reduced. Uh, and I think in cooking, they call it a reduction. Uh, and here's the first one. Never complain about what you permit. In Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse number 23, Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. All right? The word keep means to guard. The word diligence means to build a fence around or to build a hedge around. So here's what Solomon is telling me in 423. Your heart is the, it's the resource of all your boundaries. What are some things that you would not do? You wouldn't lie? Okay. Steal? Uh, would you break into somebody's house and steal something? Uh, we wouldn't do that. Why? Where do you get those boundaries? Well, I've been taught that stuff all my life, and probably you have too. You do not do that. And um, so, but what about a person that allows lying to come and go in his life? Should he ever complain about the consequences of lying? Gets in trouble, for instance. You know, maybe gets, uh, gets suspended at school. Lie in court under oath, what can happen to you? you go to jail. You can go to jail. And so I, I should never complain about the things I permit. If I allow my child to smart talk me and to talk back, should I ever complain about their smart mouth if, if they're doing it. No, I'm the one that started it. I allowed that. And so you never complain about what you allow. Number two, the problem that infuriates you the most is the problem God has assigned you to solve. Um, God has planted creativity in you. Everybody in here, he is, he's given you a creative way. For instance, uh, Thomas Edison Aren't you glad the Lord planted creativity in him? I'm glad. If it wasn't for him, we'd be watching TV by candlelight. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that the Lord gave him the creativity. And he's done that to all of us. Um, what, makes you, what makes you just boil over? What are some things that infuriate you? And, and I'll give you an example. There was a woman, oh, it's been several decades ago now, her son got killed by a drunk driver, and it, it broke her heart and infuriated her at the same time. And so she started MADD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And that was a thing that just became the bailiwick in her life. Um, so what is something, and, and see if this is, is accurate, the thing that infuriates you is sort of the thing that you have become an expert in solving. I, I, I don't know what it is in you. I know what it is in me. I hate wrong preaching. I've done some of it. <laughs> I've done some stupid preaching. Uh, but I do. I just, I despise it because, number one, it, in, it's unnecessary. You know, the Bible can be interpreted properly. And have you ever heard improper preaching? I have. You know, I've, I've heard baptismal regeneration. I've, I've heard that preached. I've heard uh, that, uh, you know, this uh, theological evolution, that, uh, you know, deistic evolution, theistic evolution, that God created the thing and just let it evolve on its own. And, you know, I, I don't believe that. Uh, just a lot of things. And so uh, what, what is it if, if you can think of something? And maybe it's the thing that, uh, that the Lord has used to provide for you all of these years in the way of a job. What, what is something that just really lights your fuse? It's what? Lazy people. 
Okay? So you've got a good work ethic, I bet. Okay? What else? Can you think of anything? What kind? Abused children. Okay? All right. Um, the, that, I think that's one of the ways that God points you. It's kind of like a, a needle on the dashboard of your heart go in this direction. This is what I want you to do. Uh, there are some things I, what are some things you don't care about? Um, I'm, I'm to the point in my life, this professional sports, I don't care about professional sports anymore. You know, I really don't. Uh, I understand just, just as a side, like, you know, the, the Cleveland Indians changed their name to the Cleveland Guardians. And here's the odd thing about it. The first Native American that ever played professional baseball was for Cleveland. And they named the team in honor of that Native American. And now, all of a sudden, it's offensive. And, uh, but I'm you know, to the point. There's a lot of things I just, I'm not going to get involved with. I'm not going to expend my energy and my effort. I'm not going to invest time fighting every cause. But there are some things that, that you are passionate about and that you would. All right, the third thing. Those who unlock your compassion are those to whom you've been assigned. See, you're not assigned to everybody. You're assigned to somebody. There are 7 billion of us on the planet. We can't do something about everybody. But you can do something about somebody. And so I, I would dare say that in maybe, and if anybody has an illustration of this, in the last, say, 30 days, the Lord has put somebody in your way that you've been able to do something for them. You had, I mean, you can be around 20 people and one of them is going to just touch your heart and it's going to, you're going to unlock your compassion for that individual. And, uh, but again, you're not assigned to everybody. So don't feel guilty because you're not assigned to everybody. That may be somebody else's assignment, but you're assigned to somebody. You're assigned to do something. And that something is your ministry. And, and a lot of these ministries are seasonal, you know, People don't need the same level of help all the time. It may be just a temporary thing, but when they need it, they need it. And then, you know, you can withdraw and, and the Lord will assign you somewhere else. But those that unlock your compassion, uh, have you found that there are people in your life, honestly, that just your heart just opens up wide open to them and you, you do what you can to help them? Do you feel that way about everybody? I don't. I feel that way about certain people. And, uh, and sometimes they're perfect strangers and the Lord just says, do this. All right. Number four, the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. Um, what we do consistently is what we do best. What do you do? Do you have any hobbies or, uh, anything? I mean, you just, and you do it every day and that's the, that's the thing you do the best. There's something that you do on a consistent basis. All right, now let's take that into the spiritual realm. I think a Christian should pray consistently. And I don't mean 24 hours a day. I'm talking about as a general average response to every situation, we should go to the Lord in prayer. That just should be something we do, not just when we have a tragedy, and not just when we have a need. But um, what if the only time, guys, that our wives talked to us when they wanted money or needed us to do something for them. They didn't say a word to us any other time. That would be kind of tragic, I think. Um, and so when we, you know, in our relationship with the Lord, I think it's a good thing, and I try to practice this, when I wake up in the morning, I, one of the first things, if not the first thing, is, Lord, Today is the day that you've made. This day, I am to worship you and to praise you in any conceivable way that is appropriate and acceptable. I want every conversation, every relationship, every intersection with somebody in, in the community or on the Internet or whatever. I want it to honor you. And um, so the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. 
Next, your rewards in life are determined by the problems you solve. Rose, what kind of problems do you solve professionally? How do you, how do you make money? You're a nurse. You, uh, you help people medically. And you solve problems. You, you know stuff your, your patients don't know, right? Uh, Nancy, the same thing. You, you know things that, that other people don't know. And Paul knows stuff I don't know. You know stuff about your job that probably people out there don't know. And so you are uniquely educated, so to speak, to do the thing that you do out there. And uh, your rewards in life are determined by the problems that you solve. Now, I, can't, I can't solve your mechanical problem. If your car breaks down, I can't help you. I can give you a phone number, somebody to call, but I, cannot, I can't fix your fuel pump. You, uh, Dave could probably jump on that for you, but uh, we're, we're not all assigned to do the exact same thing. And uh, so your rewards in life are determined by the problem. So prepare yourself to be a problem solver. I think the more you prepare... First of all, the more people with that problem are going to be sent into your life. If I'm not prepared to help you, I don't think the Lord's going to send anybody my way. And so I need to be prepared to help counsel people and to help people on a variety of levels here. And then he will send people into your life. Um, number six, intolerance of your present creates your future. Uh, ladies, let me, let me ask you guys something. Have you ever just gotten so tired of your house being disheveled? It's, okay, I, I, I can't stand this anymore. I'm cleaning it up today. You just let it go and let it go. Guys, have you car, has your car or your truck ever gotten so dirty that you're like, all right, that's, that's it. That's it. Now, you can tolerate it for a while. And then after a while, you reach a point where you're like, that's it. No more. Uh, you know, you put on that pair of pants and it's like, <clears throat> that's, it. that's it I'm stop. I'm, I'm not eating that anymore I'm not drinking that anymore and so until, until you get to the point where you are you do not like your present situation you're not going to change it but when you come to the point where and I think uh, the, these great inventors of the past they, they got tired of living in the dark. Uh, I'm grateful that Carrier invented the air condition. Uh, apparently, he lived in Florida. You know? <laughs> uh, but he figured out a way to cool air, and thank God for that. You know, I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for the electric stove. You know, I, I remember my grandma cooking on a wood stove. She cooked all day long. We'd go up to visit her in Tennessee, and my word, you know, she'd cook breakfast on the stove, clean breakfast up, and she'd start lunch. You know, we'd have lunch and clean all that mess up, and then she'd throw in wood and she'd do it. I'm grateful that you can turn a stove on and you cook your meal. and turn. I'm, I'm thankful for these things. I think we take all this stuff way, way, way for granted. Uh, but the intolerance of your present creates your future. Is there something about your life right now that you, that you want to change, but you're just not tired enough of it yet? When will, you, when will you do it? When, when you reach a point, I will not tolerate this anymore. That, that's when you'll change. <laughs> right? There are some circumstances like that. Um, and I understand that. Uh, there are you know, like medical conditions, medical situations, and, and I... My goodness, if I could just speak, you'd be the first person. I would remove every bit of your pain. And so that's, that's beyond your control, I think. Uh, right? Right, I'm sure it is. And I remember many years ago, you do the flowers and, you know, pulling weeds around and just, just doing something all the time. 
And uh, I understand that. That's, well, right now, you're right, and uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, number seven, we'll only have significant success with something that is an obsession. Uh, I think with, with most people, their work, they, they have the job they have just to produce money. It's not an obsession. Have you ever met somebody that was just passionate about something? Those are magnetic people to me. I mean, they just, they draw me in like a moth around a, a, a light bulb. I love to be around people that are passionate about what they're doing. Uh, it's kind of contagious. Do you know anybody that is passionate about what they do? Anna? Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Good illustration. Anybody in here passionate about basketball? Anybody in here going to go home and and maybe come back out to the court and play basketball or not? I'm not. See, not everybody's passionate about the same thing, and. Uh, so that's, that's the way the Lord has, he's, he's implanted this creativity and these abilities in us individually. Um, next, your assignment. It's not your, it's not your decision, it's your discovery. And, and we've talked about this. this is, I think this is just one of the most powerful things I've ever learned. Uh, my purpose in life is not, well, what do I want to do? That's the wrong question to ask a child. What do you want to do when you grow up? I think the question to ask is, what does God want you to do? And I think it is wrong to tell a child you can be anything you want to be. I think that's wrong. I don't think that's right. You can be anything God's designed you to be. Let's say here's a guy and he's 18 years old, basketball player. And he's 5'2". Is he going to be a center in the NBA? He's not going to be a center in the... I doubt, he probably won't even be in the NBA. Now, Spud Webb was. He was a little bitty guy. But uh, you understand, we're not designed to do everything. You're not equipped to do everything. And so there's something that God has designed you to do. And you do that better than you do anything else. As a matter of fact, you might do that better than anybody else. And if you are unique in that, you are going to attract people that have that same passion they will come and learn from you. Anna? How can that how can that even be illustration uh, which, which kind of brings me to this point um, you will never possess what you're unwilling to pursue if you're not willing to chase excellence and to pursue excellence you'll never be excellent uh, I, I think a lot of people are satisfied with uh, being average just being nominal not being just excellent in uh, look in Exodus chapter 33 let me read you Exodus 33, verse number 11. The scripture says, I think, a pretty incredible thing about a young man. 
The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. He stayed there. I mean, he was passionate about wanting to know the Lord. Well, when Moses died, guess where the Lord went? He went to Joshua. And uh, so you know, you'll never possess... If, if you don't want excellence in a thing, you won't have it. If you don't pursue it. How do you know that uh, lions like wildebeests? How do you know that? That's what they chase. All right? They don't, they don't chase down blueberries. They chase down other mammals. And um, so just, just look at the things that people pursue. There are folks that chase money. They'll chase it anywhere. They'll do anything to get it. Power, uh, prestige, fame, all that. I mean, they'll, they will throw themselves to the wolves for whatever they want. And um, you will, you, you just, you will never have, you will, you just, you will never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. Number 10. The only reason we fail, the only reason people fail is because of broken focus. Um, if you lose your focus, you're not going to succeed in it. And I think we're old enough in here to understand that. Um, if you, if you say, here's a guy and he's trying to start a business and all he wants to do is play golf and fish and hunt. And I mean, that's, you know, when he should be building his business, he's out on a golf course. Well, he's not serious about building his business. And uh, so this is why people fail, is because of broken focus. Number 11, loneliness is not the absence of affection. It's the absence of direction. When people don't have any kind of direction in their lives, they get depressed, they get lonesome, uh, they're inconsistent. They're up, they're down, because they don't have any direction in their lives. And so once you have some direction, you know what God wants you to do. Um, he becomes your companion, and the loneliness dissipates. When you discover your assignment, you'll discover your enemy. The thing that God's designed you to do, once you begin to do that thing, Every area, every avenue of life has an enemy. And you will discover who your enemy is. You will find out uh, the people in your life that don't appreciate your direction. You will find out people in your life that will try to stop your progress in that area. And the worth of any, any, the worth of any relationship is measured by its contribution to your priorities. If somebody comes into your life, and they try to stop you from doing the thing God's designed you to do. That's not a friend. That's, um, that's an enemy. And so people that, and here, this is a wonderful thing I think about uh, friendship, real true biblical friendship. People will respect your direction. They will respect your priorities. They will help you get where you need to go. They will provide you with encouragement, direction, uh, resources. They'll, they will help you get to the place where you want to be. Now, that's a friend. But somebody, to give you an example, let's say here's a, here's a young woman, and, you know, she's just been married and at work, and there are some older women at work that aren't exactly faithful to their husband, and so they try to draw her into the club, you know, try to get her to, to break her. That, those aren't friends. That's, that's not a friend to this young woman. Now, the kind of friend that she needs is somebody that will step into her life and encourage her to be faithful to her husband, to do the right thing with regards to the covenant that she's made with that man. And so um, when you, when you dis discover your, your purpose in life, you're going to discover your enemy. The next thing, what you respect is what you will attract. In the book of Judges chapter 11, y'all know the story of Jephthah, right? Jephthah was a young man that was, had a, had a prostitute for a mother. 
Jephthah's dad went out and, and slept with an old girl one night. She got pregnant. Jephthah was born. Well, Jephthah had some half-brothers that were sons of their mother. But these guys had, Jephthah had a different mom. And time goes on. Jephthah wasn't really well accepted by his brothers, his half-brothers. And so finally, they kicked him out of the house. The town where he grew up kicked him out. They just said, you're not going to inherit any of our daddy's money. Get out of here. You know, you're really not a brother. So he goes out, and in Judges chapter 11, verse number 3, the Bible says that he went through the land of Tob, T-O-B, which means wandering, and vain men were attracted to him. Why? Because he was vain. Now, by vain, just worthless at that time. And so what you are, you attract. When I was up at Lock Haven, teaching in a school up there, uh, we'd get a new student in. And I would always, I'd eagle eye that student to see where he went or she, what group. Because we had, we had, the, wrong, we had the wrong kids. You say, what, what were the wrong kids in a Christian school? Uh, those kids that didn't do their homework. Those kids that cheated on their test. You know, the kinds of kids I'm talking about. And I'd watch to see where this guy went or this girl went. If, if, they, if they gravitated to that group, I'm like, oh, good grief. We got another one. But if they gravitated to those kids that, you know, they honored their parents, they respected their parents, they were faithful in church, and they, you know, they did what they were supposed to do, that was always a real relief because we had another good student in, uh, in our school here. And so what you respect is what you will attract. I don't know how this works. I know it's called the law of attraction. And it's almost like, I don't think this is really how it works, but it's kind of like the universe is watching you. And what you like, it just dumps more of that on you. It attracts that. Um, kids that, that have, have a bad attitude, who's attracted to them? Kids with bad attitudes. And uh, so it's, it's just called the law of attraction. And so what you respect is what you attract. Next, people don't decide their future. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their future. What we, what we, it, it takes a habit to make a habit, and it takes a habit to break a habit. you have any bad habits? I'm not asking you to tell me what they are. Uh, but if you have a bad habit, what will it take to break that habit? Another habit. Exactly, another habit. Um, I try not to eat anything after about 8 o'clock at night. I, I want my body to have time to digest what I've eaten, and I just, we try to do that. Every now and then, you know what I'll do? I love these little old cheese crackers, cheese and peanut butter. Uh, those, oh, my. You like those, Brenda? Oh, man. Um, and, and I'll get Diet Dr. Pepper, which I know, I know, and a pack of these crackers. It'll be 10 o'clock at night. And I'll eat them. And when I'm through, I'm like, you idiot. What, what are you doing? And so I, I don't want that to become a habit. So if there's, if there's something, these kids back here, where, where can they learn? At what point in their life can they learn to make good habits? Right now. Right now. Uh, they need to expose their hearts to the Bible on a personal level right now. Because when they grow up, it will be a habit that... Uh, that they will find it's, it's just going to be difficult to break, and they don't want to break it anyway. Number 16, what you hate reveals what you are assigned to correct. And we've talked about this earlier. Um, what you despise is, that's a clue. That's a clue. Fix it. Maybe that's your ministry. The thing that you just detest that just very well be could, that could be the thing that the Lord is using to push you into the area of that. Um, everything that God has given you will create anything else he has promised you. And I, I've used this illustration with you before. You got an acorn that big around. How much additional DNA material does that acorn need to become a 60-foot oak tree? 
nothing. It's there. That's hard to believe. There's a 60-foot oak tree right there. What does it need? Well, it needs time, water, environment. It needs to be planted. Uh, what do we need? We need time. We need environment. The Lord has created the New Testament church. I think this is the perfect environment to grow. And it does a number of things to me when members don't avail themselves of what we do here, especially on Sunday night and Wednesday night. I think these are, these are the best teaching times we have, the Sunday night and Wednesday night. And it, it tells me what priorities are. And um, so the, everything God has promised you, he's already given you in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Next, patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. Uh, have you ever prayed for patience? Might I encourage you not to do that? <laughs> what creates patience? What, what causes patience to develop in our lives? Tribulation works patience. And so that, that's the only way it can work. The Lord is not going to just give you patience to use at a future time. And so the word patience means to remain under. And, uh, you know, if you push a balloon underwater, it automatically wants to get to the surface. And so what do we normally do when, you know, the Lord puts his hand on our head and pushes us underwater? What's normally, what do we want? Out. Okay, okay, Lord, I'll start going to church. Okay, I'll start doing, you know, we start negotiating. And uh, when, will he let, when will he let you up? When you die. When he no longer feels the resistance. When we come to the, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm just, I'm through fighting. I give up, I surrender. And, uh, but patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. Um, people will tell you what their real motives are if you just give them, give them a chance. Just give them a chance. Be patient with them. And at some point in the future of this relationship, uh, or this, this partnership, whatever it is, they will, they'll come to the surface. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, the bodies will float. And that's exactly what will happen if you just let, let this thing go. And then the last thing, never rewrite your theology to accommodate a tragedy. Um, I would dare say that when there's a tragedy in a, in a life, family, a community, whatever, uh, like we've just had. There are some people that, that knew him that said, all right, sure there's a loving God. Sure. There's a young husband, a young, you know, grandfather, and da 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 da, da and now look what's happened. Now they've shifted their position on what they believe about God. Uh, is there a loving God? Yes. Did this young man just get killed in a tragic accident? Yes. Are both of those things true? Yes. Never rewrite your theology to accommodate a tragedy. I don't care if it's out there or if it's us. Um, and, and when you talk about this, it gets, it gets pretty close to the bone. Because look at the tragedies that could take place in our families. And if something like that were to happen, what would, you, what would your theology look like the next day? It should purify it. You know, if there's anything in it that, that needs to be burnt out. Uh, but let's not ever rewrite our theology to accommodate a tragedy. Because God is God when there's blessing and when there's tragedy. It, it doesn't change who he is. Anna?
Right. You don't have to make up a theology. You're right. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're about to wrap up. You want us to come back there? Or are they going to come in here? Come in here? Okay. All right. Um, well, that was, that was the last one. And uh, all right, well, yeah, bring them on in here then. Okay. Hmm. Hmm.